How's it going guys? My name is Stone and welcome to these reviews or welcome back if it's not your first time here. If it ain't your first time here, that's how I should say it. That's how I usually say it. Today we are talking about one of the hippest, trippest albums to come out of San Francisco in 1967. I'm talking about 50 Foot Hose and their debut album Cauldron. Now, 50 Foot Hose began in 1967, led by a keyboardist, Cork Marchesi. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Probably. And the couple, David and Nancy Blossom. The three were wanting to blend Cork's electronic influences with the couple's psych and jazzy, or their interests in psych and jazz. And in that same year, they'd record and release an album that not only has that classic San Francisco sound, but also features some fierce and advanced electronic sound effects that were definitely ahead of its time. Uh, though they had a small following in the beginning, their, you know, their crowd grew more intense and much bigger over the years, basically 20 to 50 years after this album came out, did they really get recognized for their accomplishments and for, you know, what they were doing before everyone else. What makes this album stand above other psych records is the use of a custom-made electronic instrument by Cork, which features elements of theremin, oscillators, audio generators, and even a speaker from a World War II bomber, which I got that last one from Wikipedia, so take it as you may. But there's more that is also listed on here, so I'll try my best to take a guess if that's an oscillator or a generator. Apparently, Cork's influence uh, came from the work of Edgar Varese and sci-fi films from his youth, as well as uh, data concepts, which I'm pretty unfamiliar with. I should have done more of my research. And I also will reference, I'll, uh, I'll be referencing this zine that came into my uh, record when I bought it. I'll show more about it when I get into the pressing I have and whatnot, but... Though Cork and Nancy take most of the spotlight on here, in my opinion, I find every band or every member in the band to be essential in creating a soundscape that is both harmonic yet horrific. This record also has some fantastic production that balances out every member incredibly well. We open the album with one of the strangest openers in any psych rock album and after. Excuse me. <sighs> It's a very quiet song, but when you turn it up, it isn't anything like what other San Francisco bands were doing at the time. It's hard to tell how they accomplished the sound. I know they were using this custom-made instrument, but uh, that bassy riff that it uses, or at least appears to be bassy, just keeps drifting into these frightening tempos, and its ability to be both subtle and suspenseful goes to show just how far ahead this band was. And uh, kind of reminds me of The Residents, so I could see The Residents kind of being influenced by this. If I'm correct, The Residents were also from San Francisco, so whoa, I can see the connection. I put money on it, but I used to despise this opening track uh, for a while, just because I used to think it was just like weird filler for two minutes. But after re-listening to it for this review, I could understand why fans would talk so highly of them in terms of just, you know, creating these noises, because it wasn't that easy to make a song like that. But maybe this song's a little easier. Uh, the second track on the album, not this, if not this time, whoops. I'd say this is easily an S tier psychedelic song from the 60s. Everything about it is just done with such perfection. The reverb vocals, electronic textures, the intricate guitar riff, do, 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 do. Do, do, the drum work it all just comes together to create this amazing song that I'd say perfects the psychedelic scene of 67 though it drowns itself in this reverb and delay its melody seems to make the track more accessible than it originally appears to be but yeah when you pay the when you pay attention to the instrumentation it's really good even Nancy's vocals they're fantastic all the way through I also have to admit, I love the, how the song ends with the door opening. It's a nice use of music concrete, if I'm using that term correctly. 
I got the snare part wrong. But anywho, third track, Opus 777. It's a pretty cool little avant-garde piece that I feel could have lasted longer, but instead it just plays out as a 20 second interlude. So it's not too, I don't know, it's nothing crazy. I still like it for what it is, of course. Then we get to another favorite of mine, thing, The Things That Concern You. This song is really catchy and I love the pop sensibilities its melody and guitar has while having the vocals drowned out and uh, delay yet again. I love how the sound effects seem to be doing their own thing over the song, but still find a way to add life to the track rather than taking away from the track. Uh, though I also enjoy the part of the song where it lets the, key, the sound effects shine for a little bit. And I love the freak out nature that its outro has since they really know how to um, get their listeners paranoid, especially about what's going to come next on this record. Track number five is Opus 11, which is probably the spaciest of all the interludes. Feels like UFOs are flying over your head or picking up a cow next to you or something. Uh, track number six, whoa, we're already halfway there, kind of. Definitely the heaviest song on the album, Read the Signpost. Its use of, a, a, what I really like about it is uh, the distorted guitar riff leading into some great acid rock territory. Uh, I really enjoy the interplay between the guitarist and the vocalist, especially towards the end, uh, with how she just sounds like she's screaming from a far distance. Uh, I know this album uses like a cardboard tube or something, and I maybe that's where they're using it. I don't know. Cork, if you're watching the video, please correct me in the comments. That'd be dope. But if not, I won't be mad. Overall, read the signpost, a fine example of San Francisco acid rock, which Obviously, I just call, I'd say, is like a heavier version of psych rock, kind of like Blue Cheer or Jefferson Airplane at times. Now, fun facts, apparently 50 Foot Hose, according to the zine, they used to actually rehearse in the same studio that Blue Cheer would rehearse at. So that's kind of dope. I wish I could watch Blue Cheer shake the rehearsal studio up with their loud ass amps and whatnot, but another video perhaps. Uh, then we get to track number seven for Paula, another chill electronic interlude that definitely reminds me of something from like a s early sci-fi movie. Uh, we conclude side one with uh, the fourth normal track, you could say, the one with vocals, Rose. Now I love the laid back and jazzy sound this has, though the progression of the song constantly goes from quiet to aggressive to strange. It really does keep that quality of side one standing strong. The band's able to let loose for a few seconds, but overall the progression remains the same. And compared to the tracks before it, I'd say it's pretty tame and could have been a strong single if it weren't for the unusual effects. Unusual for the time, I imagine. I imagine though, San Francisco was down and out with stuff like that. So, hey, maybe this could have uh, went somewhere. Perhaps. But overall, I think it's a chill way to close out side one after like read the signposts and like if not this time, I do feel like it's a nice break, you know, it's like kind of sobering up from all the madness. Whoa. So yeah, side one overall, I'd say is pretty damn strong. I mean, I like the simple pattern it has with interlude song, interlude song, does that total of four times. Uh, and I'd say like, it really shows off what this band's all about already, while not showing off too much for Side 2, because I do think Side 2 is a bigger beast, and if anything, I prefer just a little more over Side 1, just for the trilogy of songs it has. Kind of like Side 2 of uh, the debut album by Grateful Dead, where it's just three songs, one's like five minutes, one's three minutes, one's ten minutes. And the way they do on this album really works in favor of each track and just as a conclusion for the overall album. Now I will say, no one was really doing anything like this band at this time. I feel like I've been saying that over and over, but the two bands that come to mind when I think of something similar to this would be The Mothers of Invention. I mean, by this time they had released Freak Out, so I'd say that's pretty similar to this. And even the United States of America, which, from what I just looked up, they didn't release their album till 1968, so it goes to show 
how far ahead these dudes were. Dudes and Nancy, of course. <sighs> we opened side two with the 10 minute epic Dear Fantasy. Uh, a terrific way to open side two uh, with a song that displays an excellent freak jam by the band. The way the song develops in the first six or so minutes is just outstanding with its bluesy guitar playing, thunderous drums, uh, honestly wonderful progression, and uh, sinister electronics all beautifully leading up to the first verse that really, uh, I don't know, capture my attention especially on first listen. Uh, though the vocals are pretty minimal on this song, they do a great job at adding to the ominous vibe by howling and murmuring over the crazy oscillators and sirens, or what I assume are oscillators and sirens. The song also ends on a really high note with the tempo picking up and building into a monstrous conclusion that just could send shivers down any hippie listening to this, whether they be on too much pot or too much psychedelics, you know? Either way, they're scratching their head, trying to scratch the bugs out or some shit. And that's not really psychedelics, wrong drum, but... Track 10, the only cover on the album, a damn good cover, God Bless the Child. Now this is definitely the most accessible song on the album. Uh, it's a fantastic psych version of a song originally done by Billie Holiday. The sound effects again do a great job at adding a hallucinatory touch, sorry, hallucinatory touch to an otherwise lovely and melodic jazz standard. I also find the vocals and use of acoustic guitar to be very fitting as I think this track's relatively relaxing sound helps uh, give a listener a break from the erratic behavior that this album contains, especially in a moment like this, you know. And I really do think, like, the overall track listing of this, like, the flow of this whole album is just so strong when you consider the fact that they put the song second to last, so you really could get a, I don't want to say you dip in quality, but you dip into the madness, or dip away from the madness, get to chill for a second, get to enjoy the song craft, though they didn't write the song, you know what I mean, like, just their ability to perform like this, but then it just takes, gives you a hard left turn. That's left, yeah. Hard left turn into one of the best, scariest songs out of 67. Definitely a big favorite of mine. Cauldron, the title track. Again, I don't know. It, 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 I don't want to say it's my favorite song on the album, but I would easily say it's the best song, if not the most influential song on the album. Who am I to say it's influential? But I definitely see it being like the most groundbreaking song on the album. Um... I feel like the horrifying nature of this track outspooks anything other bands are doing. I mean, the only bands that kind of come to my mind would be like, yeah, United States of America or Country Joe and the Fish. Uh, I highly recommend, if you haven't heard the song, don't even listen to it. Just, uh, I, just wait till your friends are around and you're trip sitting for them. Don't even tell them you're going to play the song. Just cue it for them. Let them have fun with it, and they'll always pass you the aux cord. Trust me, they're gonna love it. Uh, it'll take you places that you may not want to go, but if you're listening to it, you're heading there regardless, you know? You already bought a ticket. The atmosphere this track contains is nothing short of an audio nightmare, doing its very best to freak out with its faint screams, silent-like vocal chants, and microphone effects that, of course, the great cork provides and is credited for. It's just in a, a great song. It's kind of like, as a concluder, or a, as a way to conclude the album, it reminds me of Funkadelic's Eulogy and Light. Uh, not sure if they were on drugs making it. I'm pretty sure only, according to Zine, only one guy, the guitarist, was doing a lot of drugs. But everyone else was a bunch of sober bros, so good for them. Not like Funkadelic, but yeah. Sorry, this thing's falling, so embarrassing. Gotta get that good angle for the thumbnail, you know? Uh, anywho, that concludes the album. Doesn't include, include the review, don't go away, but... Fantastic album. Would I give it five stars? I kind of want to. The more I listen to it, the more I really enjoy it. Especially just the song crafting element of it. But I'm gonna just stick with four and a half for now. 
you know, still pretty much nearly perfect. I wouldn't argue with you if you thought it was a perfect album, because it does have a great flow and just great tracks all around. Favorite side, side two for sure, just as I said, the trilogy of songs w work well together. My top four songs, you know, I'll do top five because I like you guys, out of 11, you know, so definitely my top two of the five would be If Not This Time and Cauldron. The three following that would be God Bless the Child, The Things That Concern You, and to throw one of the interludes in there, probably and after. Uh, yeah. I'll show you off the record now. This is a, I think a 2019 repressing I got. Funny enough, I actually visited San Francisco and I found this there. It was the only time I saw this record at the time. So I picked it up, it was like 26 bucks. Not bad at all. Here's the back of it, got the bandmates on it. They all look pretty, pretty hip, I'd say. I'll read off uh, what Cork plays. So audio generators, echo lab, squeaky box siren ringing oscillator circuits microphone theremin and speakers how about that i also read too somewhere i forgot oh in the sorry i gotta make this perfect you know close enough according to the zine that it comes with written by cork i don't want to say his last name because i'm only gonna frick it up but i'll show off these photos Apparently they would like poke holes in the tapes or in the reels to give it like weird sounds and whatnot. And here's a little cool like illustration with the cauldron lyrics. It's pretty nice. And I think this is the couple, David and Nancy. And then yeah, there's Cork looking uh, much older there in that photo. Pretty cool stuff. Great album. I'll actually show off the record while well, I can. Ignore the shorts, but... I got this on a nice colored vinyl. Whoa. Very nice, very trippy. I think this is what 50, hose, 50 foot hose would have wanted had they got to pick the color. And yeah. And finally, I'll show off the little hype sticker it comes with. I really like it. I'll show it, but then I'll probably just read it. Uh, an, ele an electronic rock band wasn't even an idea when 50 Foot Hose released their landmark debut album at the end of 67. Their fusion of psychedelia and electronics resulted in a truly trailblazing sound. Cauldron stands as a significant achievement that laid the groundwork for genres that didn't even exist when it was released. Hey, damn straight, you know, can't agree any more than that. But yeah, that's basically my review, guys. I'll definitely have more free time on my hands these next few weeks or so, so I'm going to be getting around to a lot of good psych records. So stick around. I know you'll love it. I know I'll love it. And yeah, I hope to see you guys in the next video. Ta-ta, bye-bye.